Hey guys, Mr. Klein here. We are talking about Chapter 14, Lesson 1, the newest uh, lesson and newest chapter for our studies, Climates of Earth. Uh, if you took 7th grade life science in Louisiana, you talked about biomes, and so this kind of covers the same thing. Uh, by the end of this lesson, you will be able to answer these three questions. Number one, what is climate? Number two, why is one climate different from another? And three, how are climates classified? Now, when we get into the lesson, let's make sure we have uh, two ideas completely and totally separated. Uh, climate versus weather. Weather, if you remember from our last chapter that we were discussing, is the current atmospheric conditions right now and in the immediate future. Climate, on the other hand, takes a bigger view. Uh, climate, or the definition, is the long-term average weather conditions that could occur in a particular region. In other words, it's not like what the weather is like right now, but rather what's the weather like all year long as a whole. Now, a region's climate depends on several things. One is its average temperature, and also it's precipitation, the amount of precipitation, the amount of rainfall, snowfall, things like that. And not just those two things, but also how these variables change throughout the year. Is it always hot? Is it always cold? Are there four defined seasons? Is there a wet season and a dry season? All those things like that make up the idea of climate. And so we're going to dive into that in more, in more detail here. For example, what determines climate or what affects it? Well, several factors will determine a region's climate. Uh, most importantly is latitude. Uh, regions near the equator uh, have the warmest climates, of course, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more de detail in a minute. Uh, next one are large bodies of water. Uh, along coastlines, weather tends to be more constant throughout the year, uh, especially in areas like San Diego, California, which uh, Apparently, for people who live there, is the most perfect weather on Earth because it's always sunny and 70 degrees year-round. Uh, because it's right next to the Pacific Ocean, its weather remains pretty constant. Hot summers and cold winters, though, typically occur in the center of continents. That's why Russia has such bitterly cold winters, and the Sahara Desert takes up the entire center of the northern part of Africa. It's, so that because they're away from bodies of water, and they are more affected by air masses moving from there. In addition, uh, altitude, how high above sea level you are. Areas with higher altitudes are at times more rainy or snowy. And we'll talk about how altitude also det affects temperature for two places on the same area of latitude, just a couple hundred miles from each other. And finally, urban areas. Cities. Sit in cities, temperatures are generally higher due to concrete and buildings retaining more solar energy than open areas. So let's get going looking at the first one. Let's talk about uh, latitude. Okay, obviously, locations close to the equator receive more solar energy per unit of surface area than locations farther north or south. Okay, why is that? Well, because in our next uh, lesson, we're going to talk about the seasons and the tilt of the Earth, but essentially because the surface of the Earth is curved, okay, because it's curved, and uh, what will happen is the farther north or farther from the equator you get, the sun's rays strike a larger area than you would at the equator. If you uh, do the little experiment at home with, like, if you have a basketball or a soccer ball, something like that, and you shine a light at the center, it's going to get the most light because the smallest area catches all of the sunlight, uh, the light from the flashlight. However, the further away you get from the equator, the further away you get from the center of the ball, uh, the same amount of sunlight hits, but it's spread out over a larger area. And because it's spread out over a larger area, it's not going to warm up at the same rate. So, simply put, near the equator, of course, climates are warmer. Uh, near the poles, they're colder and cooler, rather. And in the middle latitudes, summers tend to be hot, winters tend to be cold. I know that's kind of common sense, but that's the way it is on planet Earth. Now, altitude. Altitude uh, plays a big role in this. Uh, if you remember, temperature increases as you increase altitude from the troposphere. As a result, if you're at if you're at two cities at the same latitude, but one is significantly higher altitude than the other, the higher one's average temperature will be lower. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's look at Google Earth, and here we are in our class, and let's go to two places. First one, 
Leadville, Colorado, a place I went to mm, when I was 12, 13 years old. It's kind of by Denver. Uh, it's at 39 degrees north. Uh, its elevation is 3,100 meters. Uh, that's about two miles up. Uh, so, you know, about 11,000 feet. It's January average temperature is negative 8.3 degrees Celsius, and its July average temperature is 13.3 degrees Celsius. It's a really cool town I've been to. It is, in the United States, the highest elevated incorporated city in the country at 12,000 feet. I think it's got about 2,500 people now. Now, if we were to head to the east at the same latitude... We go to Burlington, Colorado, which is by the Kansas border, and I'm going to zoom out and you're going to see this stuff in a minute. Uh, Burlington, another small town, uh, 39 degrees north. Uh, it's a bit lower in elevation. You so see 1270 meters, so not even 1300 meters as opposed to 31. It's kind of a big difference. Uh, almost 2000 meters are, you know, way over a mile difference in elevation. If you notice, it's still cold, uh, 3.2 degrees Celsius average January temperature, but look at the big difference in temperature. Uh, July average 24.1, whereas Leadville uh, is 13.3. Okay, so 24 and 13, that's almost 10 degrees difference. They're at the same latitude, but 2,000 degrees, 2,000 uh, meters, rather, of elevation. And in January average temperature, you have about 13 degrees, the same thing. So that change in elevation makes all that change. Which, by the way, if you're not sure what all these circles are, these are actual uh, farms, and the circle is the irrigation pattern of the water sprinkler system. So, and it goes throughout western Colorado, if you can see that. So what I'm going to do... See, here's Burlington, here's Denver, and you see this big difference in the mountains and stuff right here? Uh, we're going to talk about that, uh, talk about just in a minute. So, see, here's Leadville up in the Rocky Mountains, okay, here's Burlington uh, down in the lower foothills. So that even though they're essentially on the same degree of latitude, we got a big difference in temperature. So let's go ahead and let's head back to class uh, and get going with this. So that's altitude. Altitude makes a big difference, which is why Quito, Ecuador, which is on the equator, actually is a really cold climate because it's so high. It's about mm, eight, ten thousand 10,000 feet up like Leadville. So rather than it being nice and hot uh, at that elevation, is actually pretty cool. So there you go with the notes for that. Uh, and this is a solar radiation levels on Earth. Uh, if you notice, the redder you get, the more uh, solar radiation you receive. And you see the further away you get from the equator, pretty much at a constant rate, the amount of solar radiation decreases until you get to the poles. Okay, So that, that confirms the point that we we're talking about, how the closer you are to the equator, uh, the warmer it's going to be because it gets more solar radiation per square unit of land. So. Next thing, rain shadows related to mountains. If you saw uh, when we were looking at the Rocky Mountains, you saw it was really green on the west side and really dry on the east side. And that's because mountains can influence climate because they're barriers to prevailing winds. They stick way up in the air by elevation. The wind runs into it and stops it. And essentially, this is what a rain shadow is, and it's pretty important. A rain shadow is an area of low rainfall on the downwind slope of a mountain. Okay? And the easiest way to look at it is to look at L, uh, vegetation. So what happens is we'll have wind blow over, and it'll go up the mountains. This is the windward side. So all of the and as the all of the moisture gets dumped off as it goes up. And remember, the higher you go, the temperature goes down. The lower the temperature goes, uh, water vapor will condense. When it condenses, it rains. And so what will happen is storm systems will rain its way out as it crosses a mountain. And once it gets over, it will go down the slope and it's really dry. Uh, looking at vegetation patterns is a really easy way. And in the next photo, you, if you kind of see it on the right-hand side on my group of slides, you'll see it. Uh, Large amounts of vegetation grow on the side, expose the precipitation. Uh, the prevailing winds will blow into that side. It'll be nice and green. But on the downward slope and the downwind slope of it, the winds, it'll be really sparse due to the dry weather. And one of the best examples of this is the Himalayan Mountains rain shadow. So what we have right here, this is India. 
and the winds come from the south to the north. So as you can see, as you get up to the Himalayas, it's all nice and green, especially as you're getting up to the Himalaya mountains and the foothills and stuff. That's all these forests right here. And then once it gets over the top, uh, the storm systems have rained their way out, and so right on the other side of mountains are actually really dry areas of land, even at high elevation. So that's a rain shadow. So, so far we've talked about uh, latitude, uh, altitude, and we've talked about rain shadows, how it affects precipitation. Let's talk about uh, water also in large bodies of water. Now, first off, we need to talk about a metric unit of measurement about heat before we get into this. Okay, specific heat. This is really important. Specific heat is the amount of thermal energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water one degree Celsius. So it's all the heat needed to turn a kilogram of water from, let's say, 50 degrees Celsius to 51. Okay, uh, the name of the metric unit of measurement for specific heat is what we call the joule, J-O-U-L-E, after a scientist. So specific heat is the amount of thermal energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water one degree Celsius. It's actually pretty simple whenever you think about it. Okay, And specific heat does a lot with moderating temperatures. So if you go to the beach, it's in the summertime, you put, if you're like me and you're really pasty white, like one of the whitest people, palest people you ever know, you put on your SPF 70 sunblock because you want to stay nice and pasty white rather than turning red like a lobster. So you're out on the beach and you're walking around the sand and it burns. Oh my goodness, it burns so much. The sand is so hot. And you're like, ow, 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 my feet. And so you go run into water and the water is really, really cool. Well, this is because uh, water has much more specific heat than the sand. Water has about six times the amount of specific heat than the sand. So in other words, the specific heat of sand is the amount of temperature needed to raise it one degree Celsius is six times less than the amount it is to raise water. So if you're next to a lot of water, water will soak in a lot more heat than land would. Okay, so because water has a high specific heat, it causes climates along coastlines to remain more constant than those in the middle of continents. That's why, like San Diego, California has a nice constant uh, climate, whereas Louisiana, which generally, northern Louisiana, which is a bit away from the Gulf of Mexico, has uh, different temperatures. Uh, in San Diego, it's much more moderate. Or if you go a little bit further north and east and you get into the Great Plains, that's why you have really hot summers, really cold winters, because there's essentially no body of water affecting, able to absorb the heat, so it doesn't affect its weather. Now, one final thing about uh, bodies of water are actually ocean currents that can modify climate. Now, we're going to talk about ocean currents a little bit later on uh, before the school year's over. Ocean currents are essentially rivers of water within the ocean. Uh, oftentimes, they're, they, they form like rivers and things like that because there are different temperatures in the water around them. A large ocean current that keeps the east coast of the United States and northern Europe warmer than it normally would be is what we call the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is essentially what keeps Europe uh, Europe, and the northern United States more habitable than it normally would be. So what happens is the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico and the southern uh, parts of the North Atlantic Ocean get caught in the Gulf Stream and it passes by right here. And it spreads out in what we call the North Atlantic Drift, uh, which goes into the UK and goes up toward Norway. And what that does is it keeps this area a lot warmer than it would be normally. Because if we look over here in Canada, Labrador, Newfoundland, and Quebec, and things like that, you get lots of snowfall, it's really cold, summers are really cool. Or on the other hand, in England, and Great Britain, and um, Ireland, you have summers that are about in the 70s, uh, winters in the 30s and 40s, and it gets snow every once in a while. We're on this side of the Atlantic, you get lots and lots of snow, even though it's at the same latitude. So. That's your factors, okay? So once again, you have latitude, uh, large bodies of water, altitude, and then one last one we're going to talk about, uh, which are urban areas, okay? And we'll get to that in a second when we talk about microclimates. But let's talk about climates themselves. Okay, the current system of classifying climates was devised in 1918 by a German scientist named Vladimir Köppen. Okay, uh, he was uh, 
who was a German of, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Polish or Russian ancestry. So that's why he has the Russian sounding name of Vladimir, Slavic sounding rather. But in German, we pronounce the V in Vladimir with a W. So that's why it looks like that. If I'm not mistaken, he was actually Polish. But anyway, the Kuppen system, a climate classification, looks at a region's temperature, precipitation, and vegetation. It's native vegetation. Uh, it's it, Once again, if you took seventh grade life science in Louisiana, you know a lot about biomes and the seven in different biomes. Well, climates are kind of like that. This is the world map of the Cup and Geiger climate classification. It's a modification of the two. And if you see, if you look at it, and if I were to put a map of the biomes over it, uh, you would see a lot of overlap between the two. And these are the letters, okay, uh, the A's, B's, C's, D's, and E's. And those uh, those are basic large areas of climate. Uh, the W, the second letters are a subclassification, and then the third letter is another classification of this. Okay, so that's the, the just know that climate is divided, uh, is classified based on three things. The temperature, the precipitation, and those two things in addition to their native vegetation. So... Let's talk about microclimates. Uh, sometimes climates, you have like a small little island of a different climate surrounding a larger one. And large cities oftentimes will have this because is, the result is a urban heat island. Uh, and what happens is in the city, temperatures tend to be a bit warmer than it is in the suburbs and in the country around there. We can see this in Louisiana in Baton Rouge. Okay, so this is the Mississippi River right here. Here's LSU. There's Tiger Stadium. Uh, if we look across, this is by the Mississippi River Bridge on I-10, and you go a little bit north of the state capital. And there's a heat map. The darker blue colors are cooler temperatures. Okay, green gets warmer, red gets even warmer than that, uh, dark, and then even black is the warmest of all. So as you can see, everywhere where there's buildings or concrete, it's much warmer than the land around it, much less the river passing through. So this heat island effect is what we call a microclimate. A microclimate is a localized climate that's different from the climate of the larger area surrounding it. Oftentimes this will be temperature, uh, especially for urban heat islands and things like that. But in terms of forest, uh, the climate will be a bit different because mainly they're a little bit cooler because they're shaded and also less windy because the trees block the surrounding area and also hilltops, which are near uh, windier than the uh, lower land because it's being hit with the force of the wind around it. Okay, so microclimates, smaller climates within a bigger area. And so that's that's that for you for the different types of climates. So to sum this up one more time, just because it's kind of that important. Uh, what affects climates? Remember latitude, how high uh, away from the equator you are, large bodies of water, altitude, how far above sea level you are, urban areas which lead to microclimates like the urban heat island. Now how do climates affect different organisms? Well, because of natural selection, organisms will adapt to the climate they live in. That's why you see that's why you see uh, camels running around in the desert and not polar bears, and vice versa. Now, humans adapt to the climate they live in too. A uh, climate of a location, oftentimes for civilized uh, societies, determine what type of crops are grown there. That's why in Florida you see oranges being grown there. But however, uh, winter berries like cranberries and things like that are grown in northern states like Wisconsin because they have the cold winters, the cranberries can grow. And because it gets cold, you can't grow oranges there. Now, humans have adapted to this in building design. It depends on the climate. For example, in the far north, like Canada, and I was reading about this a couple weeks ago and it reminded Reminded me of it is pretty cool. Buildings tend to be, not be built on the ground, but rather built on stilts. This is because the ground's frozen through permafrost. Okay, the ground is permanently frozen. So what they do is they drive pilings in the ground and build buildings on top. And it's a really good idea because if you build a top building on top of the ground and it's really cold, like 40 degrees below zero, you're obviously going to turn up the heat. And when you do, that waste heat has to go somewhere. And if it goes underground, guess what's going to happen to that frozen ground? That's right it's going to melt the ground below it. And if you melt the ground below it, it turns into a big soupy mess, and guess what happens to your building? It starts to sink if it was built in a traditional method. So, for example, you have buildings like this, the St. Jude Anglican Cathedral in Equalit, Nunavut in Canada. Uh, if you notice, it's built above the ground, and that's because the heat used to keep it warm uh, can dissipate throughout the gr uh, below the building and escape rather than go directly into the ground. Because, at, like I just said, if it was on the ground, the ground underneath would melt and the building would sink. 
which would like not be pretty cool engineering wise so kind of long lesson here by the end of this lesson you will be able to answer these three questions what is climate well Climate's essentially the long-term average weather conditions that occur in a particular region. Now, why are climates different from the other? By all those reasons I kept on stating. Climate is affected by many factors such as latitude, altitude, rain shadows, and the specific heat of water. Now, how do we classify cli climates? Three things. Precipitation, uh, temperature, and native vegetation. So there you go. That's your lesson. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. And thanks for watching.